Hello everyone, thank you so much for uh, inviting me in this seminar. So I'm Arnaud Bécheler. Uh, I did my PhD initially in Paris at University Paris Sud Paris Saclay under the direction of Camille Coron and Stéphane Dupas. And I was working during my PhD on biological invasions. And it led to the development of these resources that I, I will present today, that is Quetzal. Quetzal is a C++ library that uh, aims to help programmers to develop new models to integrate distributional, demographic, and coalescence models. And I defined it like two years, three years ago, and I came to University of Michigan under the direction of Lacey Knowles in the EBE department, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And now we are mostly trying to work on methodologies to uh, disentangle uh, like what is considered as species related genetic structure from what is actually like just partial structure of widespread populations. So I will uh, present you Quetzal uh, through, through this presentation. But first I would like to introduce you to the main concepts of uh, this resource. Uh, it's a resource for environmental demogenetics. So environmental demogenetics aims to analyze geographic patterns of genetic diversity in order to inform the influence of environment on demographic. Um, so it raises several questions. Uh, what data do we use typically to inform these processes? How we formalize these models? Like that is like what statistical model we actually come with and how to extract the information from the genetic data that we have. That is like the question is what inference method can we apply? And also how to implement the method that is like what tools are available. And this is the question that is central to this presentation. So to give you a, a better idea of an example of a concrete example, it's uh, the example of uh, the Asian hornet invasion in Europe. So Vespa velutina nigritorax or yellow legged hornet uh, is causing some damages in um, Western Europe. It was first encountered in Southwest France in 2004 and he had a very fast expansion after that. Um, it presents economical and ecological impacts, uh, mostly because it's a predator of the honeybee. Um, we know that colonies right now of honeybees are kind of already impacted by pollution, by disease, by climate change. And on top of that, they have now to face a new predator. So it's, uh, it's presenting like uh, some problems. Uh, we had access to a genetic data set uh, that was, um, that was uh, sampled a few years after the beginning of the invasion. So 84 female genotypes, that's 22 loci, uh, 22 microsatellite loci. So on the bottom left figure, you have an idea of the process that is happening. So the figure shows you in black, uh, the black dots are observed nests of this pavelutina and the levels of colors give you an idea of the date, the time at which uh, the, um, the observations were made. So this map is kind of old. Now the, the population of this pavelutina has spread through all Western Europe. It's found in Portugal, it's found in uh, Spain, Italy, uh, United Kingdom, Germany even. Um, and to try to understand and inform this process, what we use is the data set presented on the right. Uh, so each line is an individual, uh, and for each individual, you have like latitude and longitude at which it was, it was sampled. And you have like a list of loci, these are bialylic markers. So you have like two values that gives the number of repeats in the sequence. So the all problem that is presented through this presentation is trying to inform the process on the left with the data on the right. To do that, uh, you will need like a general framework, modeling framework that I present here. 
where the landscape is central, uh, that is, it's spatially explicit. Uh, so across the landscape, you will have some data about environmental variables like rainfall or temperature or proxies of these uh, variables. And you will want to represent the growth process of the population conditionally to these variables. That is like here what I call niche functions. That is like what is the function that relates, for example, the temperature to the growth uh, of the population. We will see that instead of raw variables like temperature, you can actually use proxy like suitabilities, uh, suitability maps uh, is possible. Also, because it's an explicit landscape, uh, sometimes you will want to specify very, very detailed uh, dispersal modes uh, using dispersal kernels. These distributions relate the probability for an individual to disperse from point A to point B as a function of the geographic distance between them. So the the larger the distance is, the lower the probability of dispersal is. But there is concretely many ways to specify these distributions. What happens is that uh, for niche functions and dispersal functions, you end up with parameters that are usually not known with pre precision. And you just have some vague prior information about them and you want to better inform their values using genetic samples. So what you do is informing a demographic process and conditionally to this demographic process, you uh, generate gene trees that uh, establish like gen genealogical relationships between the gene copies of your sample. So that's the main idea of the model we address here. The main challenges are, of course, to choose the submodels, uh, for example, dispersal or niche function, uh, to specify them according to your biological case. Uh, and it's not an easy task. The second point is to estimate the parameters from the genetic data. And for that, you need a statistical inference method. So the main problem when you tackle uh, estimations based on such models is that uh, embedding landscape heterogeneity totally complexify the model and to the point where the likelihood function of the model becomes intractable or even impossible to, impossible to, to express. That's why generally people uh, rely on simulation-based approaches like approximate Bayesian computation or ABC. If you are not familiar with ABC, I present you here a very short summary. Uh, there are many ways to do that. It's the simplest example, uh, but it will give you an idea. So it's based on a simulation rejection algorithm. So first you come with a prior distribution on your parameter space. So I give you here like just an example case of uh, a model where you just want to infer a monodimensional parameter, so it's like the horizontal axis. The only knowledge you have prior to the experience, uh, the only knowledge you have is that it's somewhere, it should be somewhere between zero and 1000. And since you don't have more knowledge, you choose a uniform distribution to represent um, this prior, and you sample some parameters that are like the the rate ticks on the, on the horizontal axis. And for each parameter, you will simulate data under your model. And that's the, the, the Y prime uh, that, you, that you simulate. And then what you do is basically comparing the simulation to the observation. You come with some distance between observation and simulation. And based on that, you weight the parameters. So the most basic way to do that is if the distance is greater than the threshold, you just reject the parameter. You say, OK, these parameter values leads to simulations or that are really too far from what I actually observe. So I have no reason to, to think it's a likely parameter value. And by rejecting the parameters point like that, you can update the posterior, like the prior distribution to a posterior distribution that gives you a better knowledge of what should be your parameter value conditionally to the data that you observe. So that's 
an idea of the approximate Bayesian computation methods. There are many different um, variations on that. Uh, to give you an idea of the complexity that is like the, the data that you generally simulate under uh, the model we are talking about, they are not monodimensional. They are like very multidimensional. These are genetic data sets with many individuals, many loci, and many different uh, allele. And um, so what people do is coming with big methods to reduce the dimensionality of these data sets. Um, also, what happens is that rarely you have only one parameter to estimate. Uh, most of the time you have multiple parameters. It's a highly dimensional problem. And so that raises another number of questions. Um, the question I want to focus is what tools do you have to actually come with a simulation that is like you have parameter, you have a model, you have parameters, you want to estimate, but you need the simulation. And for that, you need some tools. So if you're interested in that, I advise you have a look at the Yannick and Kothor article 2020. They give a good description of uh, the resources. So they list several programs and I just selected a few here uh, and they describe them. So for example, Splash 3 is pretty popular. It's a backward simulator that is it's based on coalescence processes. Coalescence allows you like to be a bit more efficient than for just simulating everything forward in time. Uh, the level of interest is population based. It's coded in C++ and it was developed by Cura. Um, you have also phylogeosim. It's also population backward coalescence developed in Java. IBDSIM is pretty popular too. Uh, it's coded in C, like the in C style uh, by Leblois and Cawthor. And SLIM3 is a very interesting resource. Uh, forward in time, they have like very efficient algorithms. So it's like, it's a really nice resource. And they came with an individual class that allows you to center the simulation on individuals. And it's fairly recent. Um, so what, what the state of the art is right, right now is that there is an abundance of simulation program, but no library. And that state is highlighted by the, some projects documentation, for example, Eglib say that the underlying C++, like underlying that program, uh, has been designed with the aim of improving performance, but it was at the cost of safety and intuitive design. And so they recognize it's difficult to use the code components uh, that they developed. Uh, and they re-specify that in egg wrapper, uh, saying we actually strongly discourage to try to use these code components. Same, same thing for MS Prime, uh, where they state, the author state that the low level code is written in C structure as a library, but uh, it's difficult to use it. The interfaces change over time and it's undocumented. So all the, just to be clear, all these resources are um, amazing resources, like really good and easy to use um, everything. The problem is uh, that the, when you need a new simulation, a new simulation tool without library, the game is a complicated game. So basically what you do is looking at your biological system, coming with an idea of what the model should be to represent adequately this model. And you compare that to the list of programs that, is, that are available. And if you find a good fit, you use the program. So many people use Splash or their IBD sim, and that's fine. Sometimes your biological model will present important deviations from the programs in the list. For example, let's say that the kernel dispersion you want to represent is not a Gaussian dispersal, but in the programs, uh, nobody has implemented the dispersal you want. Um, what you would do is try to simulate data with the program on the list anyway, and you make your analysis, you write your article, and in the discussion, you say, well, in reality, you know that the dispersal may not be Gaussian, but we could not, like, we could not develop a new tool. And if your biological model, that's the third case, 
has really important deviations that, that make the simulation totally impossible to run practically, uh, then a new program would be required. But since you don't have a library gathering the this amount of code that is required is just too much time consuming. And so you go back to two and you will try to force your biological model into uh, a program or you forfeit and you use simpler models or more descriptive approaches. But when you have a library, the game is different. Uh, if you have a closest fit in, your, in the list of available program, you use the program and you win. And if you don't find the good fit you want, you go to the library, you gather the components you need, and you rapidly, very rapidly, you should be able to come with a new version of a program and run your simulations, run your ABC methodology, and publish your data, and, and ta-da. So that's why uh, the, we created a new coalescence-based library when I was doing my PhD, because the, the, the process we were studying with the Asian Ornet required uh, this tool. So that has been published in uh, 2019 in Molecular Ecology Resources. Uh, that's the Quetzal Coalt Library, Coalt for Coalescence Template Library. Uh, so it's a resource for C++ programmers and uh, it integrates different models. We will like, come with a better description of that. Of course, uh, we, like, I needed to make some programming choices uh, for the development. So I chose C++ because I consider this language to be a good compromise between design and performances. You can reach good levels of modularity and reusability without losing too much in terms of performances. Um, if you give as much information as possible to the compiler, because it's a compiled language, um, the compiler will come uh, with ways to make your code run faster. For example, when you compute expressions, mathematical expressions that are known at compile time, like now modern C++ is able like, to compute this expression like even before the program runs. Also what it's able to do is to give you, like to identify bugs in the program, not during runtime, but, but during compile time. And it's like really useful when a run can last very long, it's frustrating when you have a bug that appears at the end of the simulation. Uh, I chose to make a large use of generic programming, template, metaprogramming techniques, uh, because again, it's a nice way to reach good levels of modularity and reusability without losing too much in terms of performance. Uh, we will have like some example of that later. Um, and when I developed it, uh, of course, I wanted to analyze my data set, but I chose to focus on modularity and user experience. That is the, the code at the end of the day, the code that you write using this library is still fairly complex because these are fairly complex models to, to represent in the code, but um, the way you write the code is as simple as it's possible, like I hope so, like it's close enough to a, a, good, um, a good code. Um, so now just to, uh, to give you an idea of the capabilities of the, the library, I will demonstrate in its use uh, based on like the system I, I have been studying the last two years during my postdoc and it's an Australian lizard the name is Heteronotia Binoe, but you, like, we don't care too much about that. We care more about the tool. Um, so I will present you how, at the same time, the mathematic, mathematical aspects of the model, that is the concepts uh, that underlies the models, and also the way that you can represent the concepts in the library using Quetzal. So first thing, uh, you want to represent the homogeneity processes through a landscape. In a landscape, you need a landscape. So you come with this concept of a discrete landscape and that is a grid or a lattice, and you choose a number of environmental variables to embed in your model. 
So here I chose to focus only on one variable and that's a suitability map. As I said, suitability maps are fairly popular in this kind of approaches because um, it's derived from uh, species distribution models. So you give to these models observations and a list of environmental variables and it will the model will use correlations between variables and observations to come with a map of the probability to observe your individuals in the landscape. So the higher the suitability is, the higher the likelihood that uh, your species is actually present or lacks this environment. Uh, in Quetzal code, uh, the way to represent that is first to declare a single string to give the path to the suitability geotiff file. So geotiff is a geographic kind of a geographic raster. Um, so it's a specific format. Um, and then you declare a type, the type of landscape you want to use, and you use a discrete landscape. And you use two template arguments that are the string here that is like what id do you want to have for the for this variable and integer here is the time of the time i'm using so generally you want to, to use generation time so it's an integer so you once you have the type you create an object landscape like an object land and you give it the path to the to the file and but sorry you give it the, the id that is like you want uh, to access it by calling it suitability and the path to the file and then you give it the time that is represented that is its present suitability it's like present time so it's zero um, what you can do uh, is when you will call uh, the bracket operator of the land object, it will give you an object S here. This object S is a callable, it's a function of space and time. So it's very easy to use. You can call S of one geographic coordinate and one time, and it will return you a value. So it's a very easy syntax. And we will see later in the presentation that you can compose this function of time and space uh, in more complex expressions. Something that is possible too, and I added here in comment, if you want to represent temporal heterogeneity, it's possible. That is, if you come with a suitability map for present times, but for ancient times, another suitability map, for example, when climate was much colder or something, uh, it's possible. What you need is like just construct the land object by giving like an identifier for the first suitability and the path to the first suitability map. And you say that it represents suitability at time zero. And then you give a second file here and you say that it represents suitability like 1000 generations in the past. So it's possible. Um, after that, uh, since you have represented your landscape, you want uh, to initialize the demography um, what is usually done in this context is to consider an ancestral population that is not special, that's a ripe fisher population with like a number of haploid individuals or diploid, and it's assumed non-special. But at a more recent time, sorry, at a more recent time, you introduce a given number of individuals somewhere in the landca landscape. So you have two parameters here, that's T0 and X0, a coordinate and time of the introduction. And then the following history will be spatially explicit. How you do that in the Quetzal code, you declare the core type, the simulation core. Uh, so the, like C++ is a type language. So you will spend some time declaring types. So here the type of the core is especially explicit and it uses geographic coordinates, uh, a, type, a type of time that is an integer. And then these two template parameters are interesting. It's the demographic policy and coalescence policy. So what it means is, uh, so if you're familiar with policy-based design in C++, 
you would you, you would have like it, it would be clear so what it does is uh specifying the demographic algorithms that should be used and the coalescence algorithm that should be used so it's a way to um to inject uh, some specific behaviors into uh, the library components and we will talk about that a little bit later and then you initialize your core you build back your first core and you say uh, you give it the three parameters that you need and then you set the size of the ancestral white fisher population size um, and that's it then you need to parameterize the um, uh, the special process. For that, you need to uh, have an idea of the demographic growth processes uh, you want to represent. What is usually done is to focus on two quantities uh, that are the growth rate and the carrying capacity. So the growth rate or R sometimes is assumed being constant across the landscape uh, as like for the demonstration, we will make this assumption, but the library doesn't care. Uh, and for the carrying capacity, uh, what you what people do is that they define it as a function of the suitability map. So what this for those who are not familiar with the demographic, um, the logistic growth process, uh, the, um, this figure uh, explains the like impact of this quantity so you have a demographic process running through different generations in the horizontal axis and in the vertical axis you have the size of the population and the carrying capacity is the maximum number that uh, your population can reach at this location uh, so in high suitability locations um, you want this carrying capacity to be quite high but in low suitability areas, you want this carrying capacity to be lower. And the growth rate uh, just affects the, the speed at which the population grows towards this plateau. So the way to represent this concept in Quetzal code is that first you create what is called a literal factory. So the role, like the, the role of this little lit object is actually to transform a scalar uh, here like 2.0 into a function of space and time. So when you run the second line, R equal lit of two, uh, R is now a callable, like a, a function that you can call with the coordinate and a time argument. Again, it will be very important when you we will like design more complex functions later. Of course, most of the time when you design a simulator, you don't want to hard code the values of the parameters. You usually read them in a configuration file and you build an option, like an options object in the code based on this configuration file. And you read the parameters when you want them. And that's the meaning of uh, the commenting line here. When you call it on uh, a value that is read as a double, in a dictionary, uh, in an options dictionary. So here you, that's the way you would, you would build the growth rate function um, when you build your simulator. The second value, like the second quantity, the carrying capacity, uh, we will play a bit more with that. Uh, so we will complexify a little bit. Uh, let's say that you want it to be scaled by the suitability value on continental, continental cells. And for the ocean cells of your landscape, because you can have oceans and, and sea, and, uh, you want it to be null, to, to be zero most of the time. But you want, let's say you want to enable drifting, like individuals drifting from the mainland through the ocean, dying most of the time, but sometimes reach, reaching an island. Well, if you want to do that, it's easy and it at least it's possible. So you first access the suitability function of time by accessing it to the land. That's the, 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 the ID behind the first line of code. And then you declare K, uh, the carrying capacity function. It's a lambda expression for those who are like familiar with C++. And you just capture random number generator and you capture uh, the suitability that is that was defined just before. 
and you want k to be an expression of, of space and time. So it's the meaning of the second line here. You have like two arguments is the coordinate and the time. And here is some pseudo code. If it's an ocean cell, you want to return zero with probability 0 0.9 or one if not. Um, and if it's a continental cell, you scale the suitability by the value 100. Again, all the values here don't have to be hard coded. Uh, and that's the concrete code you would type. Uh, so if the suitability is less than a threshold, like an epsilon threshold, you built a Bernoulli distribution with the probability here. If the prob if and then you sample in the probability distribution. If it gives you uh, a true, you return one, and if not, you return zero. And if it's not the case, then if you're not an, in an ocean cell, you're in a continental cell, and then you return uh, the suitability scaled by the value you wanted. So just to be clear of all this uh, code is surface level in the library. That is, um, that's basically the code that is in your, in your main. Uh, so it's almost like scripting your main. You don't have to modify the components of the library. So all of the code I'm presenting here is uh, just directly accessible by uh, the programmer. You don't need to modify anything. And if you're not happy with the model, you just like record the like few lines and you totally changed your model. Uh, based on these two quantities, uh, growth rate and carrying capacity, you can uh, come with a more complex expression that gives you the number of children. Uh, so let's say you want your number of children to be stochastic. Uh, you want to sample it uh, in a Poisson distribution um, that is parameterized differently for each location of the landscape for each time of the story. So that's the sense of the G expression. The G expression is a logistic growth that has an expression here. This expression is fairly, like it's used regularly in ecology. Um, the question is how you represent that in the code in a way that is modular. Well, you define a function composition here. So auto means that you, the compiler will automatically deduce the type. The type will be actually, would be extremely complicated and you compose uh, the function, the different functions you want. Uh, so population size here can be accessed through the library interface. Uh, then you, you transform the scholar one to a function of space and time. You add it to the function R that is already a function of space and time. We just created it like two slides ago. And you do the same for the second part of the fraction and you use the carrying capacity function here. So this is a very easy to write it. Uh, then what you do is that you capture this expression within a lambda expression again. You give some uh, random number generator as arguments to coordinate the time. You create the Poisson distribution that you parameterize with uh, the expression at this location at this time, and you return the value of the like the value sampled in the distribution. So now you have like kind of a, like a small engine, a small simulation engine that represents the growth process. And you can forward that, inject that into uh, the, the other simulation engines of the library. Another aspect we did not tackle is dispersal. So I will like, there is plenty of mathematical description, but uh, we don't have to spend too much time on the details. One way you may want to represent that is using um, complicated dispersal kernels. Uh, so you have like fat tail kernels, Gaussian kernels. Uh, you have like at least 14 of them as have been listed in a, in a study by Nathan. Uh, uh, I can find the reference in the question if you want. Um, and so these are complicated ways to represent them. And here, like, let's do an easy way. You just think uh, of immigrants as being a fraction of population at a given site, at a given location. So you have just one parameter that is the immigrant rate. You consider the four neighbors of the cell that is like north, south, west, and east. 
and you spread these individuals across these four locations, like you spread the immigrants across these four locations in a multinomial, multinomial law. To represent this um, dispersal concepts, uh, you just declare these two lines in Quetzal that is like one, the demographic policy. I was saying that it's a way to specify at compile time the kind of algorithms that will be used in the simulation, saying that it's mass based, allow you to uh, use algorithms that conceptualize populations as being masses that can be split indefinitely. Uh, so it's good when you have many individuals being split on uh, just a, a small number of, uh, of coordinates. So here you just have like four, uh, four coordinates. Um, sometimes you will want to use kernels, like dispersal patterns, that spread few individuals on a very large continental scale. For example, when you have like long distance dispersal. And in that case, you will want to use a different demographic policy. That is the strategy individual based strategy. And again, this will automatically change the algorithm that are used in the internals or the internals of the simulation engines. Um, and the second line is just a function that gives you like that's a way to get the four closest neighbor. So it just like, it makes it a bit easier. Um, if you don't do anything, you will end up with um, like immigrants going in any direction uh, with the same probability. Uh, so for a number of ecological reasons, it's not always true. For example, if you are on the shoreline, you will not have one fourth of the immigrants that will jump into the sea. Uh, so you want this immigrant to not go there, but try to go in nicer places around. Uh, that's where the friction function comes in. It's a way to uh, represent friction through the landscape. When a cell has a high friction value, for example, the ocean, uh, immigrants go there with very low probability. But when a cell has low friction value, uh, immigrants tend to go there with high probability. So it's a way to change the parametrization of the multinomial law that you are using. Again, defining this friction can be done using the suitability. Uh, what you do is coming with an expression H, that is again a lambda expression. Uh, it's a function of just space. Uh, if the suitability is less than a threshold, that is like you are in an unsuitable area that may be ocean or deserts or places that are not nice for your species, then you return a high uh, friction value like 0 0.99. The highest value would be 1. Um, and else, you are in a suitable area, a nice place for your species, you return 1 minus the suitability. It's a common way to, mo like to model the friction. And then you build a dispersal kernel based on this information. You have a, a facility function that is called make light neighbor immigration. And you give uh, the immigrant rate, the friction uh, expression, and the function you want to use to find the neighbors. And you have your dispersal engine. So based on all of that uh, it's very straightforward then to simulate the demographic process you consider you want to consider the effective flow of migrants that is the number of individuals that actually spread from one place to another at a given time and these flows allow you to simulate the population size at every location at every time of the landscape you just sum uh, over the converging migration flows. Um, and the way to simulate that in the code, again, is just like one line. You call the method expand demography on the simulation core, and you give it the sampling time, like 2021, it's the time at which you want to stop the simulation. You give it the, the expression that was used to simulate the children, and you give it also like the, the kernel expression and the random number generator because you want some stochasticity. 
So here I will give you like two examples uh, I used uh, for like the last two years in North Australia, I was playing with the simulation framework and it will highlight uh, different processes. So here you have uh, across the landscape, uh, the levels of colors give you like the uh, population size uh, at the given time. So you have this population like spreading through the landscape what you can see is that uh, the way I parameterized the model, it uh, leads to very frequent events of colonization and extinction uh, in areas that are not suitable for the CTC. So all of these red dots are like just individual individuals spreading uh, from sources populations to uh, areas that are not good for them and they try to survive, but they die. And at some point, they finally reach like a secondary area that is treated for their growth and that becomes a second population source and it spreads again, it spreads migrants uh, across the landscape. Uh, so if you want a very stochastic uh, population pattern through continental cells, that's the way to do it. Uh, we will have another idea of what the simulator can do with this simulation. So this time I didn't really want like to express uh, extinction, fast extinctions and recolonization events. That's why you have a very continuous spread across the landscape. What is interesting and what I want you to focus on is like the small oscillations near the seashore on the shoreline. Uh, these oscillations are uh, actually that's the continental cell sending some migrants into the sea and they die with high probability, but sometimes they can reach a bit further. And that's why you have this delayed colonization of this island here. That is like the mainland is colonized for a long time. And after some delay, you have this colonization. So in terms of expected genetic patterns under this model, because the island is geographically close from the mainland, but still uh, lowly, like not very well connected, you expect some genetic structure between mainland and island. And you can express this genetic structure using a model that is fairly mechanistic and that can be interesting sometimes. Uh, so to connect these demographic processes to the uh, genetic process, like Again, like we, like we focused on demography, but the, the data you want to use are actually genetic data, if you remember the microsatellite data set that we had. So the, the model you will use is a coalescence model. You just consider like the set of gene copies you have sampled uh, at sampling time, and then conditionally to uh, the demographic flows and the demographic sizes that you simulated in the forward time history that we just showed that conditionally to that, you can guide the coalescent process. So you can come with uh, expressions of, uh, for um, a, a node in the landscape, the probability that his ancestor is in another uh, location in the landscape. That's a pr just a function of the demographic quantities we were talking about. And when you have two uh, gene copies at the same location in the landscape, uh, you have an expression here that tells you the probability that they find a common ancestor. So that's the way to simulate coalescence. Um, a, like the way to represent these concepts in the Quetzal code or through coalescence policies. Uh, here I will use a policy that generates new weak formulas because I, I need that for my simulations. So I want uh, to generate trees, but I want to focus on the distance in terms of in number of generations between like children nodes and parent nodes. And I want to register the, the name of each node, of each leaf, sorry. Uh, and so I'm just defining my coalescence policy and then calling the coalesce to most recent common ancestor on the simulation core. And I give it like the parameters I need, that is like my sample, the sampling time, 
the function I'm using to get the positions of the nodes through, through the landscape and to the function I'm using to get the name, like the identifiers of the leaf nodes, if it makes sense. And then the, some random generator because building the gene trees is a stochastic process. Uh, so I will not say too much about this part because uh, for a number of reasons that I will announce in the conclusion. Uh, I see Quetzal as a very flexible resource for building new demographic models. That is like if you want to play with uh, demography and if you have reasons to believe that demographic processes are the main drivers of the genetic diversity of the biological model you study, uh, that's a good way to come with a simulation uh, of these processes. Um, what is difficult to explain, but that's truth, uh, is that it's easy to couple to coalescent simulator. So because Quetzal as the library is very abstract, uh, you can couple that with other resources. And that's something I would like to do in the future. Um, that is like to use other coalescent simulators, uh, because right now I'm just like simulating new weak formulas. It's useful for me, but there are other resources outside that are really good at simulating sequences or microsatellites or based on gene trees. So I would like at some point to couple it with the, for example, the TSK library developed by KLAR and co-author that would allow, for example, like efficient generation of correlated trees. Uh, so that would be like just awesome for simulating like sequences and stuff. Um, and it's open source on GitHub. So if you're interested, have a look. Uh, the, you can find the documentation online uh, pretty easily or like through the article I shared. So thank you for your attention. Again, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present this resource. Uh, just if you have some questions, I uh, would be happy to answer them. So I know there is a, a comment, I think, in the chat. I don't know if you're able to see the chat window, um, but Someone sort of, although outside of my expertise, very interesting talk, especially enjoyed watching the island colonizations in the simulation. So just a comment to you. Thank you. Hi, Marcy, this is Arvind. I had a question. Is it okay? Great, Arvind, go ahead and ask. Yeah, uh, firstly, beautiful talk. I really enjoyed the, the way you tied all these components together. I have a much more fundamental question. I'm hearing this thing about biogeography versus phylogeography. Can you give us your sense from a expert standpoint, what these are supposed to, what these frameworks are supposed to be and what kind of questions one can uh, aim to answer using these two different approaches? Okay. Um, what my, my sense of, so I was confronted to this question when I came to my postdoc. So, um, Back in Paris, when I was working on the biological invasion process, it was a very short process in time. Uh, that is like, it's a very recent uh, process. You have very low densities of individuals. Um, and, and in terms of methodology, that had serious implications. Um, I'm not the only one that applied this method to uh, this kind of questions like Estup and Kothor, uh, they use this kind of method, they use Splatch, I believe, or a variant of Splatch, to study the invasion of uh, the, um, the Buffomarinus, it's a toad, uh, a toad in North Australia, actually. And again, it was a very recent process. It was like a few dozens of generations. Um, that is in terms of spatial and temporal scales, very different from what you would find in other applications that focus on phylogeographic scales. That is like thousands and thousands of years of history where, where the climate changed so much that you need to come with different um, species distribution models 
the further you go back in time, the less information about the biological process you have. Also, what it means that this phylogenic scales is that the process themselves that you are simulating can change. For example, the dispersal parameters can change just because of evolution. It was actually shown, I think, on the Buffo Marinus case. Uh, there was like a, a selection process. Uh, the, the length of the leg of the toad changed in uh, several uh, several um, generations in and it was like changing affecting the dispersal model um what what it means is that uh for the phylogeographic scales uh, so that is when you are focused about phylogeography um sometimes you will have not enough knowledge about the process and the process will be like too mechanistic if you are using this framework um, and you don't know really what happened thousands and thousands years ago so it will hinder your ability to apply this method uh, if you're working on much more recent history uh, that is more biogeography uh, and that you're applying these coalescence-based methodologies um sometimes you will end up making assumptions that do not hold at these temporal scales so be very careful about uh, the assumptions around the scale of movement uh, of individuals or the the assumptions that revolve around the population sizes of the population um that's <laughs> like we we published an article about this uh assumption in the Quetzal article, in the Quetzal library, you have a way to, to work at with very low densities of population and still be exact on your simulation. That's my point that's, of view on the question. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a quick follow-up question is, how much of a stationality assumption is typically made when you take these observations? The reason I'm trying to ask this question is, what if the observation point is actually in the middle of a giant flux in terms of a, a ecological uh, you know perturbation and what if you just happen to observe things in the middle of that flux versus at the end of the flux how does one know when the physics has more or less converged to some notion of stability is it possible to infer that uh, I'm not sure to understand your question can you can you try to rephrase it? Um, so I guess it becomes a problem of inverse modeling. Like you, are, you have all these forward models for dispersal and the Poisson assumption and the way these things are supposed to evolve. The physics is sort of pre-assigned, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know how much of this physics is based on where in the temporal period you're observing the physics. Like, is it happening? Is it after the system has converged to stability? Or is it in the middle of the flux? And if so, can we infer where we are in this temporal scale? That's that's what I was trying to get. Okay. Or uh, you, you, from what I understand, you are asking about uh, how to know if the parameters of interest are identifiable under the model. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, so for that, the ABC methodology allows to test for that. Usually, you would simulate pseudo observed data uh, all across your prior distribution and that is like you simulate data for which you actually know the parameters that you used and you for each pseudo data you try to re-estimate their parameters based on the methodology you used and sometimes for you will be able to identify correctly most of the parameters from the literature sometimes there are parameters you actually you don't have information about there are parameters that you need to make the simulation work, but you cannot hope to learn about these parameters using the genetic data that you had. The biological context can greatly like affect that. So for example, the sample, like the nature of your sample matters a lot. When you have 
sampled distant points in the landscape, like spread few data points on the large landscape, you will end up having like good information about like large scale processes, for example, the general dispersal patterns, and you may end up like informing the dispersal parameters reasonably well, but you lose the information that you would need to inform local processes like the landscape, the impact of landscape heterogeneity uh, on the carrying capacity or the growth rate. Uh, for that, you need uh, to um, kind of rescale your sampling, having like different scales in your sampling for which you sampled few points very far to identify large scale processes and then uh, try to oversample like small areas to try to identify other scales of the processes, if it makes sense. Does it answer your question? Very much, thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, then I would like to thank uh, our speaker for being with us today and I uh, hope to see everyone here next week for next week's talk.